Turning around an oil tanker, as everyone knows, takes a lot of time and energy and room. And likewise, the influence one person can have on a large corporation is relatively limited. But the influence Judith Henratty has had upon the corporate world has been profound. She was heavily involved in some of the biggest global oil deals of the 1980s. She was the most senior woman in BP throughout her time with the oil giant in London. Lloyds of London described her as turning the insurance world upside down. She was born here in Wellington, she did her Bachelor of Laws and later Master of Laws uh, with honours here at Victoria, and in 1986 her career took her to BP's head office in London, and it was there that she uh, truly made her mark. She led the way in devising uh, improved corporate, corporate governance, she pioneered the concept of corporate social responsibility. She served on the com com uh, Competition Commission, the Takeover Panel, the Gas and Electricity Markets Authority, and in more recent years her intervention rescued the Commonwealth Institute, which was reborn as the Commonwealth Education Trust, which she chairs. She is the very deserving winner of the 2013 World Class New Zealand Investment and Business Award, and it's my pleasure to invite her to the stage for a conversation about the art of corporate rescue and transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, Judith Henratty. Good morning, Judith. I, I, Good morning. I do, I do like that notion that you turned, uh, that, that Lloyd said that you uh, turned the insurance world upside down. Um, I, I think that's an interesting place to start. What, could you tell us what essentially happened to Lloyd's in that, uh, that, that traumatic time? <laughs> well, I think quite a lot of people here um, know the brand, and I think uh, I was just interested that brand came up quite a lot, and reputation has come up quite a lot this morning. And I'm afraid Lloyd's did the very best it could to trash one of the world's greatest brands. And when I arrived at Lloyd's, and they were fairly um, courageous, actually, to put me on the council, because I had, at one stage about 10 years earlier, taken, I think, 250 million pounds of premium out of the market. Um, I did it very gently, but it, nevertheless it went. Um, so anyway, they, they felt courageous enough to, to ask me to join the council. And at that stage, they really had not grasped what it needed to control the brand. And we can get a bit technical here. Um, basically, if I'm going to underwrite your risk. I need to know quite a lot about you, and I need to uh, reach a, an idea of how likely you are going to have an event. You end up with a, a, a curve of likelihood of disaster or whatever it is that you're underwriting. Well, Lloyd's never controlled that uh, centrally. They had a massive number of syndicates. The syndicates were all uh, based on individual members or corporate entities now that put funds at the disposal of these underwriters. And the underwriters competed against each other. So uh, there was an awful lot of internal war. They drove down their own pricing. Uh, so. And sometimes they did it when they just thought it was a good gamble. They liked to go to the races every now and again, and they saw someone else sort of getting what they thought was a good price for, uh, let, let us say, uh, windstorms in Florida. They said, oh, let's do windstorms in Florida. Why not? You know, it's a good day. I'll, do, I'll put a, a big line on windstorms in Florida. And so what, you know, coming from a, a place like BP, which was hugely engineered. BP is a company that is all about engineering and not terribly much about people, but that engineering is, uh, is fundamental to it. This just didn't work for me. I said, well, you know, you're just trashing this brand. You just, we've just got to get some, a grip on it. And I remember making a uh, remark to one of the, the colleagues there about you know, a franchise, and that's what Lloyd's was. It was a franchise, and it had devolved the right 
to use that franchise to all of this myriad of underwriting syndicates. So what we did was something really very simple and very obvious. We said, you know, we are going to control what you do in the same way as a board of directors controls what, um, what a company does, what capital it has, and what its activities can be. But of course, if you've been free for all your life, you don't take kindly <laughs> to somebody coming along and saying you can't do something. And so we had to put in a structure to do this, and we had to create a chief underwriting officer, and we had to have a, a committee, which I chaired, where people had to come and bid for the capital and bid for the right to do the underwriting. And uh, after a while, after we'd turned down a few people um, and made a few statements, they sort of got the idea. And about, I suppose, four years ago now, someone came to me um, and said, I don't think you really remember me, but I came and asked you for all that money to do whatever it was, let's say, uh, Californian earthquakes, and you said no. He said it was the best decision that was ever made. <laughs> it saved us. We would have never done it. We would have made a, a complete hash of it. Um, so I think what we managed to do was to get discipline into the underwriting. The other corollary of that was these people never reported what they'd done for three years. Mm. Now, this was all based on the fact that when a ship went to America in 1700, uh, you wouldn't really know whether it was lost or not for three years. <laughs> so the whole of Lloyd's worked on a three-year cycle. And there I was sitting one day in the early days of uh, my experience there, and um, these chaps had come along and they'd say the world was lovely and everything was going fine. And then, you know, they'd come back three months later and say, oh, well, you know, we were wrong. We've fallen off the edge of the cliff. We've got a massive underwriting loss and it's a real nuisance, but we have to go and tell the underwriting names that, you know, they've lost a, a 10 million or something like that, maybe more. I said, but I remember sitting and saying, but that, I mean, you can't do that. You couldn't do that in, in, my, in, in where I come from every day. That's just, just unacceptable. There was a sort of stony silence around the room. <laughs> How could she say that this is unacceptable? And uh, I said, but they said, turned to me and they said, well, what would you do? And I said, well, I'd just expel, I, I'd close the business down. If it was that bad, I'd just stop it. And there was another deathly silence. <laughs> and to their credit, they then began a process of, uh, of, of regulating the whole underpinning of the system uh, so that they needed, ultimately, we got to a point where there was, and to all of you uh, people who are so up in the business world, it seems terribly obvious, uh, there was quarterly reporting. <laughs> So every quarter by quarter to the end of the year, we would know. And at the end of a year, we would be able to tell the world what Lloyds had made or lost. And that, that, those very simple disciplines took a, I mean, a very ancient institution. I'm going to, it's 320 years old, um, which had lost its way in its entrepreneurial zeal and it put just clear, transparent disciplines around its activities. And, and, and it has really from, um, it survived the Twin Towers, uh, which was a massive, an absolutely massive thing, just to give you an, ex I mean, the whole of the liability account, and I'm just, you know, I'm not very good at remembering numbers over 12 years, but, we had to deposit in America all of the likely, um, uh, likely claims that would come from that event.
Transparency. Is massive. Transparency really is at the heart. It, it seems to be is, is at the heart of good governance. Would you say that? Oh, the, openness. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you you have to create a culture of knowing. Uh, being able to communicate easily and openly with people. I mean, that's what I want as a owner of a business, if mm. I'm a shareholder, I, would, I really want to see and know, or have the capability of seeing and knowing, either myself or through my agents, what on earth is going on. Mm, mm. Once you close down and you don't know what is going on, and I'll give you a, I mean, there's a classic example of really bad governance um, uh, in the, uh, and it's written up by the Parliamentary Commission uh, in the United Kingdom on the affairs of HBOS, the Halifax and, and, um, and Bank of Scotland. And there, they were running a business which was based on really, really risky lending. Mm. But no one on no executive director knew how to run such a business. Now that's a bit scary to start with. Um, and they set themselves the, uh, a massive target for loans. And of course, if you're going to lend money, you've got to get money in. But they didn't have the infrastructure to get the money in. Mm. So the loans got more and more risky as they tried to get better returns from them. And the money just dribbled in and dribbled in and was quite insufficient to deal in the end when all of these loans started to go sour. So, you know, but they presented themselves to their board and there was one classic issue there was that the board was not involved in the strategy. The board simply took the strategy that the executives had given them. Mm. And it's what I call the sort of perfectly polished stone syndrome. You know, there in the board table is this wonderful piece of uh, jade or something. It's been polished to a high resolution. You look at it and you, you, I have been in in situations where very bright young men have come in and done terribly fancy presentations. But you sort of know there's something wrong. Mm. But this board <laughs> didn't know there was anything wrong. They just looked at their own reflection in the stone and said, oh, aren't we great? Mm. Um, but underneath it was this appalling seam of a floor. This floor, and in the end, the floor got them and the whole thing was blown apart. So, you know, Lloyd's came very close to a similar sort of um, thing because structurally they had a council which was comprised of the underwriters and the members and a few of us who were appointed by the Bank of England as outsiders. And it was the wrong, it was completely the wrong um, type of, of structure to run the business. So what we had to do in that case was to put in place what we called the franchise board, which controlled the business of Lloyd's. Mm. And we left the rest of us up the top. And in fact, I ended up on both, but uh, left the, the council at the top to play the political games and to entertain the Lord Mayor and do all the other things you do in that wonderful 320-year-old uh, institution. <laughs> but that's not what it's about. What it's about is the franchise board looking after your brand, absolutely rigorously honing what mm. you can do best and doing it better. Because it is the biggest single market in the world. It is one of the largest income earners for the UK. If, if the London market disappeared from the UK, the UK would be in really serious trouble. So it, you're dealing in that stage with things which matter to every single person in the country and indeed the world. Judith, thank you for going to London to make that happen. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, I'm not I sure. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Not we'll speak all. again later. Thank you very much. <laughs>